All right, let's stand up. Let's get right into the Word of God here this morning on this wonderful Easter Resurrection Sunday. Dear Father, we stand before you now with bowed heads in prayer. We thank you for the Word, the Word of God. It's so rich and alive with your life. As I come to teach it today, I humbly thank you for anointing upon my mind that I might grasp the revelation I believe will rise in abundance from my heart within. I thank you, Father, for your anointing upon my mind to grasp it. And I thank you, Father, that you will flow from my mouth here today smoothly, accurately, clearly, without hindrance from anything, carried by your anointing, your power, and your love to each and every person's mind under the sound of my voice, bringing understanding and removing confusion, and that your word will enter every heart under the sound of my voice, bringing faith, removing all fear. And we give you all the praise, the honor, and glory for all that's revealed and accomplished through your word and by your spirit in the name of Jesus. And abide every demon spirit of COVID. You shall not operate in this building. Abide every spirit of fear in this building. You shall not operate here. You're out of bounds in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Father, for the health that Jesus paid for us to enjoy on the cross. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. All right, this morning, on this wonderful Resurrection Sunday, my message is titled, Proving the Resurrection. Say that, Proving the Resurrection. Now, we know that Jesus is alive because He's risen in our hearts. Amen. They've arrived too late to tell us that Jesus did not rise because He's living inside of me. He changed my life forever. And I'm sure He did the same for you. However, we'll always have folks in our family and among our friends that don't believe and are skeptical, and they'll need some proof, which is fine. That's just fine. So this morning, we're going to look at five different facts that prove that Jesus rose from the dead. Five different facts that prove that Jesus rose from the dead. And I'd encourage you to get out a notepad and a pen, because sure as God made little apples, you're going to need this sooner than you think. Amen. You're going to say to somebody, oh, I wish I'd taken those notes down. <laughs> All right. So now I'm going to lay some foundation, the first half of the message, and the second half, I'm going to start giving you the facts. All right. Good. Now, <clears throat> in the Guinness Book of World Records, it tells us that Sir Lionel Lucku is by far the most accomplished attorney on planet Earth because he won 245 murder trials in a row. He acquitted 245 people tried for murder in a row, and as a result, he was knighted by the Queen of England, Queen Elizabeth, actually twice she knighted him, and he was also a diplomat and a judge. So this man obviously understood how to gather legal facts. He understood that. He had a mastery, you might say, to be able to gather reliable, persuasive evidence to present that to a jury. And he took the time to investigate the resurrection. Mind you, when he did this, he was a skeptic himself, not a Christian. And he says the following, quote, I say unequivocally that the evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so overwhelming that it compels acceptance by proof which leaves absolutely no room for doubt. Praise God. He received Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior as a result of his investigation into the resurrection. And he says, my life took a 180 degree change. 
He said later, I found real peace. I found real happiness, real joy, real righteousness and holiness. Now I pray this morning that what this lawyer found, we can have some folks among us this Easter weekend find the same thing. All right. Did Jesus really die on the cross? Before we look at the facts, one theory called the swoon theory, swoon theory, is the idea that Jesus fainted on the cross or that he took some drug that made him appear to be dead and then the cool, damp air of the tomb revived him and so he emerged alive on the third day. Although no reputable scholars currently believe this swoon theory, this was topical, this was uh, very popular in uh, a few years ago. Now the author of that book, the author of that book is Abu Barak Salam Hadin. And the book is titled, Did Christ Survive the Crucifixion? I don't suppose you'd be rushing out to buy it. The lawyer, Laku, says, frankly, I was curious about this book myself when I began my research to look through the possibilities it offered, but found that nothing there was substantial. And I saw the fallacy of the argument right away. All right, so let's begin. After Jesus' trial by the Sanhedrin, which made up of a bunch of lawyers, that's um, not legal lawyers, but doctrinal lawyers and Pharisees and Sadducees came together for an illegal trial because the full council wasn't present. And uh, they declared Jesus was guilty and should suffer death because of blasphemy, because Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. Now, most people skip over this, but Jesus was flogged. He was handed over by the Pharisees to be beaten with the cat and nine tails. And most people, when they read that, just skip over it. But a physician by the name of Dr. C. Truman Davis actually analyzed the practice of the Romans back in that era, in the first century, when they beat people that way. And this is what he learned in his study of history, this Dr. Davis. His conclusion was that Jesus had been mercilessly whipped to the very edge of death. Jesus was tied to a post and beaten at least 39 times with a whip that had jagged bones and balls of lead woven into the leather. Again and again, the whip was brought down with full force on his bare shoulders, his back, and his legs, according to Dr. Davis. At first, the heavy thongs cut through the skin only. Then, as the blows continue, they cut deeper into the subcutaneous tissues, producing first an oozing of blood from the capillaries and veins of the skin and finally spurting arterial blood from vessels in the underlying muscle. Blood would just be squirting from his body. The small balls of lead first produce large, deep bruises, which are broken up by continuous blows. Finally, the skin of the back hangs in long ribbons and the entire area is an unrecognizable mass of torn, bleeding tissue. One witness to the Roman flogging gave this description. The sufferer's veins were open to exposure. Now, some victims died before making it to the cross. Undoubtedly, Jesus was in serious critical condition even before the crucifixion. And it's no wonder that history tells us he was unable to carry his own cross. Later, five to seven inch long spikes were driven through his wrists and through his feet. Dr. Alex Matherell, a different physician, 
who has studied the crucifixion as well, said that it would generate an agonizing pain like squeezing your funny bone with a pair of pliers. Now, I don't know if you've ever bumped your funny bone. I have, and it's no fun. No funny, funny bone. And, uh, but imagine if somebody takes a pair of pliers and gets a hold of that funny bone and just squeezes it like for a few hours. So brutal was the death by crucifixion that a new word was coined. A new word was created. The word excruciating. And the word excruciating comes from the Latin words out of the cross. The Latin words out of the cross form this word excruciating to describe the crucifixion. After his wrists and feet were nailed securely, Jesus was hoisted up into the air to hang on the cross. And Dr. Matherell said that death from crucifixion was basically a slow death of suffocation. Because as they hung there like that, and they sank down, their shoulder blades would squash and restrict the lungs and the, the lung cage um, from expanding and contracting. So they could not breathe, they'd suffocate. So they have to stand up, relieving their arms so that they could actually breathe. And when they pushed down, they weren't pushing down with their feet on a flat surface. No, they were pushing, he was pushing down with his feet on a spike. And then his back was going up and down on a wooden cross with splinters on it, and it was really bare, no skin on it, just torn, ripped flesh. So you can imagine the agony just to catch one breath while being crucified. And so they did die from exhaustion and suffocation eventually. Now, if the Roman executioners wanted to hasten the death of those being crucified, they used a mallet to come and smash the ankle bones of the ones on the cross. So they just smash their ankles, and then obviously with broken legs you can't stand up, and they can't breathe, and so they'll suffocate immediately. But when they came to Jesus, they found he was already dead. But the Bible tells us they did break the ankle bones of both people on either side of Jesus. But when they came to him, they found that he was already dead. And uh, to confirm this, the soldier thrust a spear between his ribs, puncturing the sack around his heart and puncturing his heart itself. And the Bible tells us that water and blood flowed out, and science proves that exactly what happens in that kind of circumstance. So blood and water came out of his body, and he was already dead before that happened. Otherwise, they would have broken his legs. Now, let's be clear. No one survives the crucifixion, not even Jesus. He was dead. He wasn't swooning. Clearly, listen to this now. I'm going to read you a report here from the American Medical Association Journal, which is a respected, highly respected journal, published 21 March 1986. Here it is. Clearly, the weight of the historical and medical evidence indicates that Jesus was dead before the wound to his side was inflicted. Now, there's no doubt about it. Jesus died. And Locke, who the lawyer says, and there are five categories of evidence that point affirmatively to the resurrection as being an actual event of history that occurred on that day. Now get your pen and paper out. I'm going to give you five facts to prove that Jesus rose from the dead. Number one, the reliable testimony of history. In 1 Corinthians, a book written by the Apostle Paul, approximately 20 years after Jesus rose from the dead, when Paul mentioned in 1 Corinthians that the resurrected Jesus appeared to 500 people at once, at one time, Jesus appeared to 500 people alive. 
And uh, he specifically stated that many of those people were still alive at the time Paul wrote the book of Corinthians. All right? So Paul says in his letter of 1 Corinthians that Jesus appeared to 500 people at one time, and many of those people are still alive today, 20 years after the resurrection. So in effect, Paul was saying this. He was saying to his right to whoever he's writing to, hey, this happened so recently that these witnesses are still around. Ask them yourself if you don't believe me, and they'll tell you it's all true. They'll tell you it's all true. They saw Jesus alive. All right, the second witness. There's the empty tomb, the empty tomb. It is unanimous. The body is missing. Nobody to this day has ever uncovered the body of Jesus itself. No one's covered his body. No one's found it. Jesus was laid to rest in a tomb belonging to Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the Jewish council. And the vault was sealed and placed under heavy Roman guard. You can read that in Matthew 27. However, it was discovered empty on Easter Sunday morning. The fact that the biblical record says woman discovered the tomb empty lends strong credibility to this account. Because woman had low status in Jewish society and didn't even qualify to be a legal witness in court. A woman could not even be a legal witness in those days in the Jewish society. So if the disciples were manufacturing the story, surely they would have said that men found the tomb empty because the testimony would have had credibility to it. This is just one more indication that the biblical writers were committed to accuracy according to what had actually happened and weren't creating stories. All right, the third point. The most powerful evidence concerning the empty tomb is that nobody ever claimed it was anything else but empty. Everybody said it's empty. Everybody. Nobody said, nobody ever said it's not empty. We saw a body in the tomb. No one ever said that. Even Jesus' opponents admitted it was vacant on Easter Monday morning. The Bible, they tried to bribe the gods to say the disciples stole a body away while the gods were sleeping, which doesn't make any sense because if, if they were sleeping, how would they know who stole the body? How would the gods have known it was the disciples who took the body if they were all sleeping? Let's read the account from Matthew 28, verse 2. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning, and his clothes were as white as snow. And the God shook for fear of him and became like dead men. So the gods, when they saw this angel shining like lightning, can you imagine, it says they fell down like dead men. They went, fell under the power of God. But the angel answered and said to the woman, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who has crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, come and see the place where the Lord lay. Skip down to verse 11, please. Now while they were going, behold, some of the gods came into the city and reported to the chief priests all things that had happened. All right. So the gods came and told the leaders of the Jewish faith, the chief priests, that this angel came down, rolled a stone away, and Jesus is gone. He wasn't there. And we all fell out. <laughs> and when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers. 
So these Aldis, these Pharisees and Sadducees, gave a large amount of money to the soldiers, saying, tell them his disciples came at night and stole him away while we slept. So go tell everybody that the disciples came and stole the dead body while we were sleeping. All right, so how would the soldiers know the disciples did it if they were sleeping? That's the question, right? 14, and if this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. So if the governor ever finds out the truth, we're going to put you in jail. So they took the money and did as they were instructed. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. So Jesus' opponents admitted the grave was vacant, as we heard right here. The ones that crucified him admitted the grave was empty. The question is, how did it get empty? That's the, the question. The lawyer, Laku, says, when I was first trying to solve this mystery as a skeptic, I went through the list of sus suspects but found that all of them lacked motive. All those who he thought might be the ones that stole the body, none of them had a motive. For instance, the Romans wouldn't have taken the body because they wanted Jesus dead. The Romans were concerned about an uprising of the Christians and them claiming a new king and overthrowing the Roman Empire. They were concerned about an uprising in Israel and around the world, and they were happy that Jesus is dead, and they didn't want him to be alive. What about the Jews? Well, they wanted Jesus to stay dead because they were the ones that said, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. They wanted him dead. They wanted him to stay dead. Both the Romans and the Jews would love to have got that dead body of Jesus and walked up and down the streets of Jerusalem showing everybody that Jesus is dead. Because if they could have done that, they would have stopped all the uprising, stopped Christianity, and we wouldn't be in church this morning. We would have no faith in, it, in Christ because he would have been dead. But he's not. He's risen. Hallelujah. What about the disciples? Well, would the disciples be involved in trying to steal the body? Why would they want to live a life of suffering, persecution, and then be tortured to death for what they knew was a lie? If this had been a charade concocted by the disciples, certainly one of them would have broken ranks under torture until death and said, hey, listen, we're only kidding. But all 12 of them were tortured and then executed because they believed in Jesus and would not deny him. Why would all 12 of them be willing to be executed if it was just a joke or a lie? Nothing less than a witness as awesome as the resurrected Christ could have caused these men to hold fast to their confession that Jesus is Lord and Jesus ha is alive. Only seeing him alive would let them go through all that and confess that he is alive. Only the resurrection would cause them to be tortured to death and not deny him. All right, the fourth fact is the eyewitness testimony. Not only was Jesus' tomb empty, but over a period of 40 days before he sent up in the cloud, he appeared alive a dozen times to more than 515 individuals. Jesus appeared to men and to women to believers, 
to doubters, to groups and individuals, sometimes indoors, sometimes outdoors, in broad daylight. He ate with them. He even invited Thomas to put his finger into his side, his hand into his side, where the spear went, and put his, asked Thomas to put his finger into his wrist where the nails went, and he ate food with him. So yes, he appeared alive to many people, the eyewitness account. And the experience that Thomas had, remember he's called Doubting Thomas, because he doubted that Christ lived. He said, unless I, unless I put the, my hand into his side and my fingers into his nail prints, I will not believe that he rose from the dead. And, the, and Jesus came, appeared to him, and he did that. And then Jesus, and then actually Thomas died a violent death in South India uh, because he would not deny the Lord. He said, Jesus is alive and he's Lord, and he was executed because of that. All right, point number five, the emergence of the church, the emergence of the church. Now, suppose that during the political conservative days of Ronald Reagan, now the administration of Ronald Reagan, very, very conservative here in America, and let's just say you were here at that time, and for whatever reason you left America, you had to go overseas to live for a few years. And then you came back just after the new president was sworn in. And let's just say that the American population, the American people, voted in a communist, Marxist, to be the new president. Right after Reagan, now, you would come back to America and say, what has happened to this country? What a cataclysmic event caused everybody to change so radically? What caused that? Well, a doctor by the name of Maudlin uses this illustration between, you know, voting in a Marxist to what happened to the Jews. Listen to this. For the Jews to become Christians... They had to abandon five major Jewish traditions. Now remember this. All the disciples were Jewish, the twelve. In the upper room, in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit came down on the day of Pentecost, there were 120 Christians, 120 believers in Christ. All of them were Jews. Not one Gentile. Not one person who was not a Jew, even Mary, the mother of Jesus, was in that room. The Holy Spirit came down, they all spoke in other tongues. Now, for all those Jews to change from Judaism to Christianity, they'd have to change in five areas. And this is going to shock you. All right? Number one. They'd have to switch from Sunday, from Saturday, Saturday worship, the Sabbath, which is Saturday. They have to switch from the Sabbath worship on Saturday to Sunday worship. Now try and tell a Jew to give up the Sabbath to worship on Sunday. See how far you get. They gave it up, all 120 in the upper room. Number two. They also abandoned the system of sacrificing animals for forgiveness of sins. Now we know throughout the entire Old Testament, they all sacrificed animals for the forgiveness of sins according to Jewish religion. Now imagine telling a Jew back then, you don't get forgiveness of sins from that, you get forgiveness of sins from Jesus. See how far they got from that, saying that. All right, the third point, they abandoned the law of Moses as a way to maintain right standing with God. And you know, anybody who says anything negative about the law of Moses, they would stone them to death. But yet the 120 Jewish believers in Christ abandoned the law of Moses to accept forgiveness or right standing from Jesus. The fourth thing they did is they embraced the concept of the Trinity. Now, if you told a Jew that... <laughs> We believe in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They would have said, we believe in one God. 
one God, Elohim. They would not abandon that under any circumstances. Even though Elohim in English is actually God's. It's plural, right? And the Bible says, and Elohim said, let us make man in our image. Elohim is God's. And God's said, let us, plural, make man in our plural image. But the Jews believed in one God. So the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit were all involved in creating man. Now then, besides that, a little side journey. Now, for them to abandon the Trinity, or for them to abandon the one God and come for the Trinity, would take a miracle. Only the resurrection of Christ could do that. Because if they did all that, there would be social outcasts, and according to Jewish theology, they would have their souls damned to hell forever for doing all that. No, only the resurrection would cause Jews to do that. All right? That's our fifth point. Now then, the early church was fueled by the sincerity and enthusiasm of the disciples. They were on fire. And yet, these on fire disciples of the Lord, after the resurrection, ran away when they took Jesus for the trial. When they captured Jesus on the Mount of Olives in the Garden of Gethsemane and took him for trial before the Pharisees, they ran away, went their different ways. They didn't want to be associated with Jesus. But these same disciples of the resurrection were willing to die for him. How would they ever do a thing like that except they saw him alive? Except they saw him alive. They were willing to die because they knew Jesus had risen from the dead. Praise God. Well, I sincerely hope that you learned something from this message this morning.